All right, so hopefully you're, you're in the right spot. This is software and packaging and deployment with IBM Endpoint Industry. So first of all, hello. Um, there's a lot of cool presentations going on. Some of like guys came to mind or got stuck with me, if that's the case. Um, I see a lot of familiar faces here. Um, if you don't know me, uh, my name is John Tindall. I work on Sysman and CLM projects here at Penn State. Um, part of the University Services Group, which is part of, I'm not sure what SSD stands for. It's Systems and Services Development Group, which is part of CLC, which is part of TLT, which is part of IGS, which is part of So, I really have no business talking to you about this stuff, but I do package a lot of software for the groups for the labs, for um, the system. So, I'll try to impart a little notice in this video. We'll see how it goes. As you can see, I'm probably the only one giving a presentation on a Windows computer. That's what it is. Um, our group mostly works with Windows, but um, I do sit across the hall from Justin Elliott and Dustin Murray, so I'm learning to become a Mac daddy. It's going okay. This is a lie. Right here, these uh, slides are not online. I had a little computer problem this morning, and things crashed. And so I actually just got done working on these. So after the presentation, though, I should upload. So sorry, you can't follow along with that. Um, if you don't know too much about me, uh, my group, we're kind of introverted and weird. So this is kind of outsider element. So. In packaging software deployment and systems management in general is not really a very sexy job and it's pretty boring material. So we always try to put in some sort of gimmick. Um, last year we did a lot of cartoons um, two years ago. And then the year before that we did um, cheesy business soft photos that went over pretty well. So I was trying to think of what I possibly do. So I'm gonna try this. I hope you can be entertained. Nice. Um, so we'll see how it goes. Um. <laughs> so, obviously, we're going to talk about software packaging. And we're going to do that with IBM and Pilot Manager. I stuttered there because also really known as Pilot Manager, Pilot Manager, don't mix technology and then. Just regular big things. But this is what we use. If you're not familiar with us, um, actually, how many people here are from Penn State? Awesome. Cool. So I think there's a couple people that are not from Penn State. Um, who's actually using um, Big Fix for their Macs? Yeah. And um, so then I imagine the rest of you are here to learn how to do it. And then the rest of your area just for the so that's cool. Um, so we offer a service called Systems Management at Hennessy. Using Tilly and Point Management, we provide that as a service to other units. <clears throat> so if you don't know about it, it's pretty nice because it's multi-platform, which means all your devices can be in the same console at the same time. Um, Windows machines, your Mac machines. Don't ask me about it here, uh, but we're working on mobile device management platform to see all that stuff in the same in the same console. So that's why we really like this. Um, that's what I have to say about that. Um, I actually didn't look at the slides yet, so I'm going to be just as surprised as you are. <laughs> so a lot of you here are using Tom or thinking about it, have exposure to it, maybe to one of our classes. So doing doing a presentation like this is always kind of hard because you don't know like, who's going to be in it, how much information they have. Um, I see a lot of you already have some familiarity with it, so, but I already finished the presentation, so it's not like I can change it. But, um, so you might already know some of this stuff. I hope you can get some things out of it. Um, we'll see. Uh, well, at least it'll be a review. We'll learn about how to make some software install it has for the Mac. And then I think we're going to get into troubleshooting things. Um, I think in the description, 
is kind of recycled. They talk about web reports and analyses. We're not going to really get into that. There's not much to cover. So if you're offended from that, sorry. Leave now. Okay? It's not that fun. It's okay. So there's a lot of different things in town. There's a lot of different terminology. We use the word fixlet, we use task, what do we mean, what's the action, what's relevance. So let's take a look at this just for review. So we're all on the same page. So a fixlet started long ago as something that fixed something. So you had a vulnerability in your machine, whether it's out of date software, whether it's an unpatched system. You have a fixlet to fix that problem. Once it's fixed, then um, the fixlet no longer applies. The task is pretty similar. However, it was originally intended as something to execute on the machine. So think of something like restarting the machine or changing the administrative password. That's something you're going to reapply after a while. Now, we hear some people, it flows their boat to call a task, a fixlet, a fixlet a task. And that's okay because physiologically it's kind of like you and me, we're all the same on the inside. Um, we use this terminology called Tasklet, don't actually say that because you look like a guru. Fixlet, the important point is that Fixlet and Task are pretty much the same thing. So if there are some people say Fixlet, if there are some people say Task, we'll see what makes each one different, but basically everything is the same. Action always gets a little bit tricky because there's kind of two, two notions for it. There's, you can think of action as in the sense of have a fix that has a series of actions in it that you execute. So those are actions. Um, has built-in commands to do file manipulation, execute programs, things like that. An action is also something when we deploy a fix like when we deploy a task, um, a baseline, things like that, that's actually called an action itself. So sometimes those are fun. Relevance is kind of like a weird Uncle Sam. We don't really like to talk about it that much, but it's probably the most important thing. It like, brings everything together and ties it in. This will help you determine where these installers and how which machines will be applicable to. And um, also help you when you're writing an action script to be a little bit more dynamic about things. So this is the console. Probably should be familiar to everybody. <clears throat> if it's not, that's the console. Um, you see everything here. That's nice. Um, so it doesn't matter if it's Mac Windows. You see a list of tasks. The thing to note on this is that it is a Windows-based system. So if you want to get to it, you're going to have to remote desktop into our terminal server. We don't actually provide a client to people. So I usually use Core. Seems to work better for me. Um, that's really only because I like Remote Desktop Connection Manager, which is a Windows based thing. So they do the same thing for me. So that's how I get my jobs. Now, this is an actual fix up here. You see, you can have descriptions. Um, what's nice about this, we saw on an earlier slide, is that it actually audits things. So that's what's going like that because we can see who actually created the fix layer when the last time we modified it was. Um, you can also see information about what's inside. So this is actions that I was talking about. And we can see what it does. We can see success criteria, like what, how we want um, the fix layer to behave, you know, how can we determine whether or not an installation is successful. And there's also a comment feature. I don't think anyone's ever used it. Here you'll see a list of all your machines uh, that this task is applicable to based on your own session. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. And then what's also nice is that you can see an action history of what, um, what actions were deployed, whether they were successful, or not. So, <clears throat> We're going to talk about now how to actually create the song installer. So this is kind of remedial, this next part, but I think it's important to familiarize yourself with the process. 
we want to look at installing software. And I drink a lot, so sorry. So <clears throat> you want to use the command line, because that's actually one of the best thing about using Tim is um, anything that we can write in the command line, there's probably about a 95 to 98 percent chance that you actually can work in Tim. I'm not going to say 100 percent because there's Every now and then, there's some strange stuff that just doesn't work. <clears throat> but the reason we do it from the command line is so that we can make our software unattended and silent, so that it doesn't interfere with users. Um, <clears throat> we deal with classroom labs. On here, that's where the Tilly Employment Manager mainly came into play, so we can put really stuff in the background. And that actually works really well with faculty and staff machines as well. So unattended means that. If you're familiar with Windows, that would be like an MSI exec slash B, where you just see a, cross, a, a progress bar and uh, installation goes without any user interaction. We take that a step further in town and we <clears throat> also do what's called silent installation. So that just means that it's in the So if you think about, if you think about how we actually do it, you download a piece of software. <clears throat> On the Mac side, it's usually in some sort of container, like a disk image or a zip file, something like that. And then you actually run your installation. So the first thing you do, here's Skype. <clears throat> it sounds dumb, but the first thing you do is you get the piece of software. And then usually in the Mac side, it's in a container. And it's important to, it's important to um, think about the container because this is a Windows system, so if you have something like a PKG or an application bundle, which we'll talk about, if you don't know what that is, <clears throat> Windows sees that as a spore. So if you, usually you can upload it, but you run into problems, some things may be missing, and all that. So I think most things in Mac anyway come in these, at least the one that we use. Archive, same kind of situation. Um, <clears throat> What's nice about these is they split the commands to um, extract these. So, again, we're looking to do this from the command line. So, <clears throat> we're lucky on the Mac side that a lot of this stuff is already built in. So, if you were going to mount a disk image, this is the command you would use. Notice that we throw in private, no browse, and that's to keep it hidden from usable. <laughs> Those are the types of that so an application on the Mac side is really easy. Um, also notice that we're not going to really talk about like how to actually package like an app, like a package in the sense of a fixed package. <clears throat> so <clears throat> we're going to assume that things come in this application level. And so on the Mac side, it's really easy. We just copy this into the recorder. So if you open up this disk image, you just copy this into the And that's, that's the common command, and that's what we'll do to do that. Pretty straightforward. I think it's important to know because we'll use this later. Um, the package is kind of like, almost like an MSI um, equivalent on the Windows side. <clears throat> so it's an actual scripted like installer. <clears throat> and you'll see here, this is iTunes. It doesn't really, it's not something you can copy over. So luckily, there is a built-in command for this. So we just install it dash package in the package. So for example, this is how we would install iTunes from the command line. Uh, the only thing to it's pretty straightforward. The only thing to really keep in mind is the slash there just means we're installing it to read. Okay. <clears throat> so that was just my brief spiel on how you do it manually. So now we're going to actually look at how you install a piece of software, or what you're going to do when you want to put a task into template. The very first thing you do, um, just the other day, I found this really awesome website where you put stuff in and you can find information. So whenever we build packages that we don't know about, the first thing we do is we use Google, because that usually works for us. Um, <clears throat> Try to look for the answer. Put in the name of the application and sign up the store. You don't really have to worry about that too much on the Mac side 
Again, it's pretty easy. I mean, everything looks pretty straightforward, but it's still a good idea to test. But um, if you run into something that's non-standard, Google's your friend. Now, the next step, if you don't find it in Google, or actually, if you know the package, and you're going to make a package, the first thing to do after you do Google is to actually look in temp and see if something is already provided. Maybe someone already packaged your stuff. Now, other institutions probably can't do that, maybe not, but when we have our stuff at Penn State, we can do that. We subscribe to packages from IBM, so they provide packages that you guys can use, um, all the standard stuff. Um, the thing to note is that these are traditional fixlets, so <clears throat> in order for them to work, they actually have to look for the package on there. The package has to be there already, and then it updates it. Um, it's not really for new systems. So for new systems, we have um, a service called Software Share. And here, this idea is something we started uh, before we knew how big it was going to get. And it seems to be really popular with a lot of units. We package a lot of software for everybody and make those available to the sysmin community so that you guys can use them. The thing to notice about this, is, or to know about this, is that we really go through a pretty rigorous uh, testing process with these. So not everything here um, we have right now, but we are working on adding everything and downloads of IKS download the IKS at Pacer and then also anything that's site license to the university we're trying to add those. Because there's a lot of duplication. Sometimes some people get a working light and sometimes others don't. So <clears throat> these are available to you and we recommend that you use these. Um, now this doesn't really apply so much on the Mac side yet, but I don't know if it's top secret information or not, but um, the Mac side is going to be piloting CLM soon. Uh, Mac ready in the fall. Um, you didn't hear that from me. Cut that out. But um, on the Windows side, anyway, we offer CLM, which means that you can see other people's packages and you can use them. And eventually we'll be able to do that on the Mac side, otherwise, you should get into that. So, <clears throat> Greg is actually one of our software packagers for Sysman. He does a pretty good job. Um, he puts the descriptions in. He uses action parameter queries to make sure new specific information is only entered on good stuff, or it's only entered um, dynamically so it doesn't interfere, so you're not going to be using someone else's license and all that. But we have this one guy. And this other unit who packages stuff and he puts information, serial numbers, into his um, installer task. So we had a case last year where one guy was using it and started using, using someone else's package and then was using his license. So not very cool. Now, he probably won't go to jail, but he did. So when you're looking at packages, anything from the PSU site, um, if you're a Penn Stater, it's good to use. Anything from the IBM site is good to use. We're going to make sure that we are in compliance. We're going to have licensing information on there, where to point to if you want to use it, stuff like that. It's when, and we'll, we'll, we'll look at how you can see other people's packages in a little bit, but it's when you start using other people's packages, it's a good idea to just send them a note, send us a note, say, hey, can I use your package? Is there anything I should know about it? So, before you actually make your package, I recommend that you use a testing bottom. And it's a little bit easier on the Windows side, but I think this is really important because, especially, especially on the Windows side, but on the, on the Mac side too, just because a software package does something, or just because you're familiar with it, it doesn't mean it might do that exactly what you want to do. So, what I like to do is I like to set up one machine for each operating system that I have. 
have a deployable with 10.7, 10.8, I would have two machines for that. You have blank installations, pretty much just the operating system. Now, if you do like energy and stuff like that, you might also want to have um, a couple systems like that so you can deploy stuff to them. When you're testing the installers, you probably want to just have just a blank installation. And I like to have one admin account, one user account. Um, you see this more on Windows side too, but sometimes applications run a certain way. It's just a good way to find out what it's doing. Now, like I said, on the Windows side, you can use things like VMware, Hyper-V to make a really quick and clean um, virtual image, and then when we're done, we can reset it. On the Mac side, it's not so, nothing that I know of in the way. You guys might be more, but so I use Mac Minis, and they work pretty well. And so I always like to refresh those images. Um, a good way to do it is that we have um, a tool from Penn State called Last Image Config that's developed by CLC, and it's actually pretty good at restoring restoring images. <clears throat> so that's just. He doesn't know about this yet. <laughs> All right, so what this also does is it kind of sounds stupid, but when you install a package, you kind of need to know the name of the package and the version. So we wanted to check, could we use that to check and see if the software package is installed? So what we're going to do is we're going to look in the applications for it to see where that is. And then if you right click, you can hit information about the package. And what we really care about is the version there. Now, I've seen packages that don't always have that. So if you're familiar with Windows, there's a thing called plist, which is sort of like a registry for Mac, sort of. And in there, you can find information that you need. So the actual full name of the package, which is what we're looking for, and the actual full version, which is what we're looking for. Now, sometimes you run into situations where it's not an actual application. So I'm thinking of something like Xcode, maybe Flash Player. <clears throat> so this is one way that you can try to find it. Now, it really only works if you're installing the package, or if you're installing a package like a PKG file. Um, but if you run that command on iTunes, we'll actually find the different plists that are on the machine. And then what we can do is use the PKG tool again to actually see all the files. Okay, so we run that on the plist, and then we'll see all the files that that installer put on the machine. So that's another way to that's another way to look and see. You know, what information is put on that machine? Can I find something that's unique? Um, we ran into a situation with Xcode when we were trying to figure the command line tools for Xcode when we were trying to figure out how is this um, get installed. <clears throat> and one person had said, well, it just puts a port for GCC, so you can just check that way. You check that way. What if you're actually installing GCC? So we use these commands here and we were able to find where it put this actual receiver. So if you come across weird stuff, that's a good way to try that. This is another place you can look to find out information about the machine or the installer. So it's kind of like the event log in Windows and application logs. So you can look there. Um, other than that, ask us. We'll try to figure it out. But that's pretty much all we um, came across. So, now, we're going to actually look at how to create a software installer. And so, there's a, you can do it from scratch if you want to, but when um, Tem provides um, what we call a software distribution, which is what we use. Now, I will admit to you that Big Fix started, see how I'm interchanging the words, um, Big Fix originally started out as a Windows-based platform, 
And I said, hey, man, we should probably do that stuff, too. So a lot of the stuff is kind of an afterthought. And the software distribution wizard is kind of on the same lines. But it's a quick and easy way to upload your content into town. So it's a pretty straightforward process. You open up the wizard, and then you type in your application name. This is how you're going to find it in the console. Now, when you get here, there's a couple different ways to do it. You can download directly from the vendor's website. I don't always recommend doing that, in particular for packages like Chrome. Um, is one I can think of off the top of my head, where the installation or the <clears throat> link is in the PMG is exactly the same no matter which version. You just keep on replacing the same file over and over again. The thing to keep in mind about ten is that it actually checks the shell and hash of the file, and it also checks the size to make sure that nothing is being manipulated. So if you have a task that does that, <clears throat> and they change that version, then you run into problems. So we usually like to directly upload it. That's how we recommend doing it. And I've seen in the past where, say, somebody wants to do a bundle installation of <clears throat> Mozilla products. So they'll put in Firefox, they'll put Thunderbird DMG into a folder, and then try to upload that. Now you can do that, but if you're familiar at all with object oriented programming, we like that whole idea of using stuff. So we try to break up things as much as possible. And there's a way that we can, co can combine the software and take a look at that too later on. But so the rest of this is pretty straightforward. We just go through and we select which operating system we want. Then we, um, right here we're trying to determine the relevance that's going to be used to see what task is successful. So what we can do is we can just put in the name of the application, that's what we want to do that. So we can see <coughs> what it is. Alright, so we can make sure the installation works correctly. I'm not sure why this is here, but, um, because you can change this later on, but one thing I always do is I put what the actual installer does so that it is only installing or if it's installing and upgrading, or if it's just changing something like prefix the name of the package. Look at that. So that's pretty much the task. At that point, it's done. Now, one thing to keep in mind whenever you do the task is that you have to make sure that you change out of your um, operator site. It, what it does by default is it puts it there. And that's only available to you. So, you may run into a situation where <clears throat> you have other people in your unit and you want to you put the task in the operator site and then you try to use it or you try to share it with other people and then you say, hey man, use my task. But it's not there because that's only available to you. So by default it does that, probably so you can test and all that, but always remember to change that um, into your division site. So you'll see here that it generates all the action scripts, so that's pretty cool. Um, you don't have to really do a thing. I kind of do, but we'll see. We'll talk about that later. We put in that operating system information and we put in um, those application names, and it automatically generated the relevance for us. So we didn't have to write that. So that's what's really nice about using the software distribution. Now, it does come with caveats. Um, like I said, it's kind of an afterthought. It seems like a project that they started, had good intentions with, and then kind of dropped them along with other things. So it's always a good idea to do some more from the software distribution of the that's already there. So you'll see here that you know we have our operating system and we have our application, but remember I said earlier that we also need to know the version. It doesn't actually put that in there. So if you deploy version one of your application and you try to update with version two, it says, hey man, that application's already there. And then we run into a case. 
two where say you need to have it's ten point seven, but it's actually ten point seven point four now. So sometimes we have to go in and add that into the relevance. <clears throat> and that's pretty easy. And I think I think I just showed this in here. One of my colleagues actually does a relevance class. So it's a lot of fun. Um, so you should really take it. Um, but it's just kind of like, this is just kind of a cleaner way to write it. James is actually one of my colleagues. And he really likes clean relevance. So this is why I do this for him. Um, <clears throat> but it's just kind of like programming. There's a lot of different ways to write stuff. So remember, like I said, we have to actually check the version when we're checking to see that the software package exists. So right here, if you want to see the iTunes 11.0, this is all this is, and this is how we do it. We just say, hey, is there an application named iTunes? And it is version 11.0. That's cool and hunky dory, but if you actually want to install iTunes, it's a little bit of a different story. It's kind of almost like Yoda speak a little bit, and kind of have to think about it a little bit backwards. So, what you're actually doing here is in one line. Now, again, you can break it out, but for clean code, what we can say is first thing we want to do is check to make sure that no iTunes exists on the machine. So that's what this top line does. But then also it does it's kind of like a bonus round where it's also checking to see is there not already a version of iTunes that's newer than the one that I'm trying to push out. So it's a little weird. It's something you have to get used to. But what's really nice about 10 is that the relevance is 85% the same. So it doesn't matter what your application is. You can usually just replace iTunes with something else. Say Chrome. You got your version for the current version too. Yeah. Uh, I like to think of it as this application has things really out of the Like if you're pushing out that version and it's already there, then you don't want to install a screen with that not in So you're asserting what you want to be in the vault when it is not in front of it. You're saying, my end result is not there, so they're probably going to do what I'm trying to do. Hopefully that makes sense. I don't know if it's yeah. easier. Yeah, there's <clears throat> a whole bunch of different ways to think of it. Um, that's actually pretty good. So, like I said, when you're writing relevance, sometimes you have to get a little bit more complicated than that. <laughs> and on the, like I said, on, on the Windows side, they got. It's not perfect, but they got a lot of things down, and they're, they're doing great. They have a fix with the bugger, and <clears throat> has a nice GUI. You can check out your relevance. It also can execute actions all there, and that's really nice because you don't have to go back into the console and try to redeploy things. On the Mac side, they kind of started that, and then kind of dropped off a little bit. <clears throat> they do have a tool. That's called Q&A, and what you can do is, this is a really awesome tool, and you should put this on your test machine as well. Um, <clears throat> we provide the installer on our install share, 40 systems installers, and um, what this allows you to do is just use relevant statements, and you can usually get about 90% of your statements correct using this. Um, the thing to keep in mind is that there's a new version of Q&A with each version of the client. So anytime you install a new client, you want to make sure you also install the newest version of Q&A so that you get all the features. So that's just a small thing. Some people forget that. <clears throat> so that's helpful here to complete our relevance. So we're going to add that part at the end. Now, like I said, the software distribution wizard for the Mac, it's okay. Like, 
It's the job done in probably for 75% of your applications in the next 12. Um, it's kind of over ambitious, in my opinion. Um, it puts a lot of junk in there. And uh, I understand what it's doing. Um, <clears throat> maybe not as clean and straightforward, because sometimes it doesn't always work. Um, I, if you take a look at that, um, <clears throat> What it's doing is it's checking to see if the package that's uploaded that's in your download store is PKG. If it's not a PKG, it's going to check to see if it's an app on the Vatican company. Um, if it's an undergo, it's going to see if it's an app script that's canceled. So it's kind of like an all in one action script. It usually works, but sometimes not so much. I've run into a few packages, mainly with PKGs, where it doesn't really work as well as I'd like it to. Sometimes we'll skip it. So I usually just like to take out this whole section <clears throat> and rewrite it myself. And luckily, with since in the Mac world, a lot of the stuff you save, you can reuse a lot of your stuff. So this is kind of a good place to talk about ActionScript in general. You can see it's pretty straightforward. It looks kind of like a programming language. The stuff in blue <coughs> is um is the actual action commands so you can see that you can manipulate files and you can run stuff and you can throw in relevance in order to check your dynamic information. So that's pretty cool. Now, if that's not your bag <coughs> and you really like to use shell scripts, there's actually a place in there where you can say, hey, I'd rather use shell scripts and then just switch from action script to that and then write your shell code. If you're really old school, you can, it even has a section where you can <coughs> write out a script. So that's pretty cool. The moral of the story, on that note, <coughs> it doesn't add no browse. I think in older versions, it really doesn't matter. I think in newer versions, <coughs> you run across times when we needed to have that, to actually have it hidden. And sometimes when it didn't matter, so we just kind of always throw it in. I like to get rid of the entire if statement um, that checks for the different kind of installers and just write my own. And like I said, we can use those command line command lines that we had before in order to do it. It works out pretty well. So there's one more thing that we have to check. And this is where we get into that idea of the fixed lit versus the task. And all this. And I said, remember that we, at least we anyway, try to write our task in this business. And what happens here is that when you have a command, it usually has an exit code. And usually that code is zero, and that means there's an exit authority. The thing to keep in mind with that, though, is that a task runs by default through all the lines of the action script. And as long as they exit it successfully, it's cool. So this is why you may have a command that it says complete, or a task that says it's completed, but it didn't really do anything. Um, one case I can think of is HDI util could return a one, where it's not finding the file, and that, but it actually completed it. It spat out and it's like, so Tim thinks that it completed. So <clears throat> there's one way we can get around this, and this is what fits like do by default. So you want to set your success criteria. You can do that right from the task itself. By default, on a task, it's set to that second one, which says, yeah, I'm complete when all lines execute. You want to hit that first one <clears throat> to say, and what it'll do is, after it gets done executing everything, it'll go and it'll recheck that relevance. And that's usually a better way to actually make sure that um, your task actually installed. So we don't always do this. I don't think we do this in CFM. We try to do this for the most part in software sharing to make it a little bit easier for people to see. So it's up to you how you want to do it. I personally think it's a better way to make sure your stuff installed. And then now you don't really want to do that on something like where you restart your computer. Maybe you do, but <clears throat> it's going to use that relevance to reevaluate itself. And so usually I keep that for software installation tasks.
So, now we're going to talk a little bit about organizing stuff. Because um, this always gets a little bit tricky. We always get some questions about where things can go because you can put things in different spots. And some people can see it and some people can't. So, if you log into the 10 calls, you can see a bunch of different sites. Um, depending on what services you're holding, you may see CLM sites, you may see CLM Mac, you may see your own system. Units. This operator site is what we were talking about before, where um, this stuff is only for you. Only you can see that. Usually we recommend only using an operator site um, when you're testing stuff. You don't really want to put production things in there because the whole idea of TEP in our multi tenant environment is to get other people to collaborate and to see your stuff. And if <clears throat> you put everything here and deploy it from there, then other people in the unit can see it. And also, when you put things in here and deploy it, you really have to be careful. There's things called automatic groups, which will take a look at it a little bit. And <clears throat> you can accidentally really kind of screw up things if you deploy it to all your computers at once. It'll take care of everything that's in. It'll take care of your CLM unit. It'll take care of your mind. It'll take care of all your computers. So if you're a part of CLM, if you're a part of CLM Mac, there's a top level CLM stuff with CLC, like group, puts all of our things. <coughs> and these are tasks that anyone who's part of a lower level, they can see that top level. So that's also what's really nice about them. Is that you can easily distribute rights. So if you're from a Windows world, think of Active Directory. It's inherited. So if you see CLM, my unit, usually what that means, we usually give read rights to those. So you can see other users' folders. So that's where the whole um, good guy Greg and this company Steve stuff comes into play. Because you can see other people's tasks. And we design it that way so you can make sure that you're not needlessly re, uh, re, uh, repackaging stuff. But you got to be careful with that. Your mind unit is going to be typically your system and stuff. So that's where probably all your faculty and staff max will go. And the thing to keep in mind with this is anything that's going to be in your mind unit is separate. It's a kind of whole different container than you steal them on you. And that's set up by design to help protect you. Um, the PSU site is where you're going to find all of our tasks that we create, things that we think um, will be useful to everybody, like um, software sharing tasks, any tasks that we have, little commands, things like that. So, There's a notion of baseline, which is really like, think of it as a collection of software. So you don't really want to deploy tasks one by one in piece, but it makes it hard to keep track of things. So what we do um, is put things into baselines. This is really nice because it allows you to organize your stuff and order them in a certain way. So you can create baselines, and we do this in CLM in particular. Um, we put core software in one baseline, and we make sure that it runs completely. And then once that's done, then we are sure that we have all the prerequisites that we need, then our second one can run. And then we can fan that out a little bit. And it really makes it easy for you to see where your software is going. So this is what a baseline looks like. <clears throat> um, what's nice about this is that it works from the top down. So you know, install the thing on top first. And then work its way down and it goes in order. So <clears throat> if you have something like Firefox and then you also want to include um, a browser plugin, put Firefox on top, make sure that runs, and then that way you're not overstepping things. You can make sure that everything operates in order. You can add pretty much any fixed or task into a baseline. This is probably our biggest gripe. It's really hard to do because there's no search function there. So <clears throat> if you're going to add a task or a fix to the baseline, you kind of add your component and you search through all of them. You try to keep it clean. 
Um, but there's still a lot of stuff. And actually, now that I think of it, um, one way might to do it might be to go back into the console, and you can search from there, and maybe search for the task that you want, and then right-click it, and then add it to the baseline. I think that works. That might be an easier way. It, it's not really, there, there's no really good method of doing it, unfortunately. <clears throat> so there's another thing to keep in mind when you're doing the baselines, and you run into issues people where you, know, you add all your stuff to a baseline, and then it's not showing up as applicable to any of your computers, and it gets really frustrating. Um, usually what we do is we like to set baseline levels to true, so it's applicable to all machines, and then we want to use the relevance of the task. So, you would think this would work by default, but it doesn't. Um, so the one thing that you have to do whenever you're adding a piece of software to a baseline, you want to make sure you check this box right here. You have to actually expand the task and then <clears throat> click the box. What this does is it tells the baseline, hey, you know, what I want you to do is look at the relevance of this task, and if it's um, Pluggable and make the baseline pluggable. I have talked before about automatic groups, and this just is to make your life a little bit easier. The whole idea of using uh, Sysman, CLM, Tibly Endpoint Manager is to automate your entire so uh, software distribution process. That's our ultimate goal, if I didn't say before. And so, <clears throat> what we can do is we'll take a look at this, I think, hopefully in a second. Um, we want to deploy software, and it just makes it easier, especially if you have like a lab or even back in the staff machine. You have an automatic group for your humanities department or your engineering department. This allows you to make, to, when you're doing your baselines, make a baseline for humanities. Make a baseline for engineering. <clears throat> Make a baseline for room 205, room 206. Maybe each one has a different set of software. It really helps make your life a little bit easier. <clears throat> and there's a lot of different properties that you can look at. You can use the computer name. That's usually how we do it. We have a we have the naming convention. And so if we had we know that all our machines in room 205 have a prefix of uh, room 205 somewhere in there, according to the building. There's a lot of other different properties that you can look at. Too many, that's really for us to go over. But <clears throat> always put your stuff in groups. So now we're going to actually talk a little bit about pulling your fixes, pulling your tasks. And these are called actions. So here is <clears throat> a typical software solid task. That's from software sure. And we have a lot of different actions in ours. So we have actions that we'll check to see that'll do a normal installation. Maybe another action to check to make sure to install a program that disable auto updates. Maybe another one runs only when a user um, is involved. Maybe one another one runs only when the application isn't running and one that maybe kills the application and the story. So the point to know is that there's many different actions. So <clears throat> in particular, when you're adding tasks to a baseline, always look at the task and make sure you're using the action that you actually want. Um, so this is where the automatic groups come in. You can go and you can select the computer. Um, whenever you deploy, then you can select the one, computers one by one. We don't really met, recommend that for ongoing software installations, um, <clears throat> but for a test here and there, that's what we do. You can go through and you can select your groups, you can select by Active Directory, you can select by different properties, uh, a lot of different options. This uh, execution tab is worth a little bit of a note. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of different settings you can set. One thing to keep in mind is that this whole notion preset. So it's a good, by default, I think, um, fix lists and tasks expire after three days. 
At least that's what it does in our environment. And baselines execute as a policy. Like the policy means that there's no end date. Um, we're in the process now of um, adding presets, and you can add your own if you want to, but we're trying to make some global presets. So we have one here now that we just created called CLM Phase 4. So if you're a member of CLM Phase 4, which is unit packages in our environment, you go and select the Phase 4 baseline. The important things to know is that you can set your own <coughs> um, by going up the same preset. But you can set what's really nice about Tim is that it's one of the only systems management platforms that has the capability of not just pulling the software, but checking to see if that software installation worked or didn't work, and then reapply itself until it actually works. <coughs> so you can actually control how much you want it to try and retry again. <coughs> so you can go in and set different settings. A couple of things to keep in mind is, say you're deploying like a large package, like um, Creative Suite or something like that. <coughs> you want to do it over the weekend, and you're going to do it all at once. You have 100 machines. Your network guy probably is not going to be too happy if you try to do that, because you have the package up on the main server. So if you pull it down to a relay, on your canvas, then that is going to get pulled down to each machine because the software installation is run on the local machine itself. So it's going to pull that package down every single time. And I may have forgotten to mention that, <clears throat> that the installations run on the machine itself. It's not like some other where it runs from the server. So, moral of that story is that you can actually set to stagger the action time so that if you're doing it over the weekend, hey, let me stagger that over 12 hours so it'll randomly select you know, which one's the script. If you have like maintenance windows, like, you only install software from 5 to 7 a.m., that's really easy to set here. Um, you can set when you want it to start and when you want it to end. I don't really use the users too much. I usually write that in the action script. But you can go through here and check to see if you want to deploy an action, you can use this to check and see if the user is logged on. If you only want to deploy certain groups. Another neat feature is the concept of messages and authors. I can't think of too many times where you would actually use the message. Um, it might be something where you have an installation and it kind of runs unattended, not really silent, and it may pop up a window. And you may want to say, hey, don't close this command. I've never personally really used it, but it's something you can use. The interesting one is an offer. The big buzz right now is to take away admin rights from the users. The problem with that is that how do you get the software to solve on the machines? You need to administer. Matrix runs in the Windows context as system, which is what it does in the Mac context, which is root. So when an action runs, it doesn't matter what privilege the user has, it's going to run as the root privilege, so it can install anything you want. So this is a really kind of cool way to empower your users, so to speak. So you can present to them a list of software and they can choose whether or not they want to install it. So I do know a lot of users are user, units arguing with that. So if you choose to do an offer, I think this is an offer, they'll get a whole list of software here, and then they can choose which ones they want to install. So situations where you might use that is, <clears throat> say there's a big UI change to, the only thing I can think of right now is Office, where you went from Office 2003 to the ribbon of 2007. Maybe some people want that, maybe some people don't. This is a good way to um, give them that option. What you can also do is say, I really do want everybody to move to this new version and set a time limit so that they can put it off however long you set, but after that deadline, it's going to be installed eventually. So this is just a message. You can set it to pop up before the installation runs. You can set it to pop up while the installation runs. 
So one thing to keep in mind with um, actions when you deploy them, inevitably you're going to make changes to it. If you have a baseline, you're going to add new software to it. Maybe you had a typo in action that you deployed to everybody. <clears throat> thing to keep in mind, each action is its own entity, its own doing thing, so, and it's unique. So <clears throat> if you have this action, there's a problem with it. You may think you want to change the baseline, change the task, and that you can just restart this. It doesn't actually work that way. <clears throat> Once you take an action, it's kind of done. There's a button to restart it, but if you make a change to your baseline or your action, it doesn't actually reset this one that you already pulled. I don't know if that makes sense or not, but the thing to keep in mind <clears throat> is that if you do make changes, always redeploy. So if you have a baseline, you update a component, stop the current one that you have, and then take a new action. Um, one thing also to keep in mind, you run into this a lot. <clears throat> I, I mentioned that you can deploy baselines as policies, you can deploy tasks as policies. We usually recommend putting your tasks in baseline so it's easier to see. Um, but we always recommend deploying open, open actions to automatic groups. And similar to the actions, the computers are kind of component. Each one gets assigned an ID. And so when, say, you rebuild that computer, use the same name, you think it would be the same machine. But it actually isn't. It pops into the, <clears throat> pops into the server, gets added to the database, has a new ID. <clears throat> so if you deploy an open action to a machine by selecting the machine name, then once that computer is rebuilt, checks in, it's going to have a different ID. Meanwhile, this action is actually looking at the old ID, the old computer, even though it doesn't exist. So what that means is that you might have orphaned actions going where you think you're actually updating stuff, but you're really not. This is why we recommend using automatic groups. Um, this way what happens is that the computer ever leaves um, the town, but then comes back and say you're targeting, your, you have your group set to look at the machine name. Once that rechecks in, the, the group actually looks at the machine name, not the ID. So you add it to the group, and then your baseline will apply to the public computer. <coughs> so, I'll talk a little bit about troubleshooting. We kind of mentioned this inside, but there's just a couple things I think to. You can see some stuff in the action history, like I said, things are logged. So you can see here, probably can't see here, but <clears throat> this task failed somehow. If you look at, actually downloaded um, the application OK, then it got stuck when it was checking SHA-1 hash, and then when it was checking the file. You can't see there, but it's also checking to see if the process um, or whatever it's running exists. And so it failed here. My thought would be that probably the application is running. So it failed the if statement. Um, but you're not sure. And there could be other situations where you might see a failure of some sort. So in a case like that, luckily we have a thing called logs where we can look in. And each client produces a log of every action that it takes. And so if you go into library, application support, big fix, Fez agent, all the way down, you'll see a log for each day. And it'll log all the actions that you can see. It logs every communication with the server and all that talking there. So you can go in and think I have a log. Don't expect you to see it, but this is just an example of a log here, and you see the communication with the server, you see each action that it's undertaking. The main takeaway is that read the logs, you really find a lot of information in there. You can see here that, again, you can't really see here, but what this is doing is 
it successfully completed a file, or um, downloaded a file, it extracted stuff. What it's doing right now is trying to create a file. In this particular case, I think it's trying to create a script. So <clears throat> the command where it actually created the file worked. Now, if you looked close here, you would see that it actually fails when it's trying to mount the DMG for the installer. So, <clears throat> what probably happened is whoever created this created the script, but they forgot to actually execute the script. So, when an HDI user <coughs> exited with an executor 1, um, it didn't have anything to mount. So, <clears throat> using the logs at the end of the day is a really great way you can't find what you're looking for when the actual history isn't really telling you what's going on. And it's also a good way to see if um, see if what's happening, what what, is, uh, what you want to happen is actually happening. You know? <clears throat> so Tem is not actually for everybody. There are some things that it does really well. There are other things that it doesn't do so well. So we run a Windows environment primarily. So we recognize there are a lot of limitations. Tem is good for some things, not good for everything. So we try to combine it. The things that it's really good at, like software, deployments, command <clears throat> line based stuff, we'll use it for that. Things that are a little bit better for like group policies, so like adding people to the groups. Um, firewall settings, those actually work a little bit better in um, the tools that are built for that, Active Directory, Group Policy, things like that, so we'll use the best tool for the job. So same thing for the Mac. <clears throat> it works well, but there are some places where you may need a better tool to use, but I think we're at about 30,000 in most of those are Windows, and we have one of the bigger points of the big things. And now that they're with IBM, they really appreciate Penn State Farm. And so <clears throat> the more people we get into the service, the better pool we have. If we have a lot of pool with them, and we're able to implement a lot of features based on the feedback. So we can do the same with Mac. Like I said, we have 30,000. I think by the end of this presentation, or as a result, we're trying to get to this. But um, <clears throat> obviously, the more people we have, the better pool will be. So I think that's pretty much all I have. Um, but I can't leave you without talking about our Syscan user screen meeting. Um, I think this is our second one. It's going to be um, June 12th. And we hope that everybody can come. I don't think we have this link publicized anywhere. Um, so, but I think if you go to the IPS training website, you can look for it. Um, you all can come. If you're part of CLM, definitely come. Free lunch. You might be able to sneak into the lunch if you register anyway. But um, <clears throat> should be a lot of fun. We'll talk about things more specific to the environment. And I think it's actually being held here. So that'll be cool. And it's a free afternoon off work, so that's all it does. So I think that's all I have. Does anybody actually have questions at all? I'll be available here. Um, one of the things that we're actually doing, I, I know I've said this a lot, <clears throat> it's always hard to do a presentation like this like in this environment. It's good if you can, like, get on some machines and actually do some hands-on work. So I've been kind of bogged down with a lot of stuff, but actually after this, um, I'm finishing up um, the slides and materials for an actual software packaging course or attempt hands-on to use a little bit of the lab environment and actually dig down and get into some more advanced stuff. Um, is anyone actually interested in something like that? I guess I'm able to have to do it. Um, <laughs> but, you know, so that, I hope to have a date announced at the smoke meeting. Um, but yeah, um, in the meantime, um, feel free to contact us. Um, 
I offended you in any way, or if you think of any other questions, just send us an email. Uh, that's usually the best way. Also, if you ever run into any problems, feel free to email us. The only thing we would just ask is provide us a little bit of information, what computer you used, what software package you were trying, especially if you have any problems with the packages that we create. Um, we're definitely here to help. We have a good team with you. Send it to this address so for everybody. So I think that's it. There are some resources for you, um, where to find stuff, contact information. I'll leave this up for the rest of the thing. Um, that's all I have.